And um, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. It's a pleasure to be here. Um, as Catherine was just saying, you have to do something different. This presentation will be very different to the last one. Um, my name is Simon Gogol. I'm the Chief Investment Officer for UK Equities at Allianz Global Investors. And I'm also the manager of the Merchants Trust. Um, I, my title of my speech today is um, Investing for Income in UK Equities. And it's a really interesting time looking for income. And another speech later, talk later is about income as well. Um, it's a challenging time, and I'm going to start by talking a little bit about some of the challenges in income at the moment, some of the themes, and then talk a bit about Merchants Trust and how we, how we go about investing for income. So I'll start with a quote. Uh, this is from a very well-known magazine called Newspaper Investment Week, 8th of March 2016. Fresh calls for the IA Investment Association to abandon the archaic yield criteria for the equity income sector. Now, this is... For the, uh, I'm very glad Russ has set the scene of open-ended and closed-ended funds. This happens to be about open-ended funds, but that's not relevant. What's going on here is the investment association is, is, is a lot of investment funds. To be classified as an equity income fund in the open-ended space, you have to have a dividend yield 10% above the market. So uh, that's fairly straightforward. And this is now regarded as archaic by some people. So many funds have been investing in good quality, defensive growth companies, great businesses, tobacco, beverages, consumer goods. Um, and the problem is, as those shares have gone up, the yields on those companies, the, yield, the dividend yields have fallen back. So the funds that own these companies are no longer offering the dividend yield that's a big premium to the market that it historically was. And so, naturally, they don't necessarily want to sell their shares and the investors, the fund managers, and buy the high-yielding shares, which might be Royal Dutch Shell or HSBC or Glaxo, where there are some very well-known risks out there. Um, so they'd rather change the definition of income, and there's a whole consultation going on to do that. Um, that's, that's fairly straightforward, but there's a problem. The issue is, of course, investors, such as yourselves perhaps, and many others, um, need income especially in an era, era when interest rates are really low, government bonds pay you virtually nothing, the bank pays you virtually nothing. People do want income. And many, many people actually like buying high-yielding shares as well. Um, high-yielding shares have historically performed very well, um, which is another reason why people like to buy high-yielding shares. Um, and actually, in my view, certainly, many of the low-yielding shares today are actually quite expensive. So our solution to this quandary is actually... We like the high-yielding shares. Um, we like the discipline of selling the low-yielding shares after they've performed well and buying cheaper shares that are more depressed. Um, and the, high yield, the appeal of high-yielding shares isn't just about the dividend. In fact, it isn't about the dividend at all to me, but the income is important. Um, it's about the total return you can get from buying these high-yielding shares. And I'm going to share with you some, some observations about the high-yielding market. So, just going back to basics, this, this chart, sorry, it's a bit complex, goes back over 45 years in different countries. But if we start with the UK, what you see over 45 years, this tiny grey slither is the revaluation effect of the market. So the dividend yield 45 years ago is not a long way away from where the dividend yield on the market is today. What you've got in that 45 years is you've got a bundle of income in your return, and you've got some growth in the dividend. As the dividend grows, so the share price moves up with that dividend growth, and the yield stays broadly the same. So you've got about, in the UK, you've got a 4.8% return per annum um, over 45 years. And almost all of that, in fact, more than all of that, has come from the dividend you started with, all the accumulated dividends, and the growth in that dividend. And the valuation, the yield valuation of the shares, hasn't really changed. And you see a similar picture in other countries. In America, there's been a bit of a benefit from revaluation. And in Japan, I think that is, uh, Australia, sorry, there's been a bit of a drag, a quite a big drag, because the market is devalued over that period. But generally, the bulk of your returns as an investor has come from income and the growth in that income. And the valuation basis, uh, it's almost tautological, but the valuation basis doesn't really change much over a very long period of time. Should you fear dividend cuts? <laughs> Clearly, at the moment, you read every headline, every newspaper today is talking about how dividends are vulnerable, whether it's HSBC, whether it's BHP Billiton, which cut the dividend, Barclays has cut the dividend. Should you fear this? Well, yes, in some ways you might. I mean, there's a... Oh, sorry. This is a great chart from SOCGEN, a Société Générale, and it shows that at different levels of dividend yield... So, for example, this... Oh, sorry, wrong one. Um, companies yielding less than 4%, they tend to deliver you that 4% yield. 
or 4 to 5 percent, they tend to deliver you that yield. As you go further up the income scale, and companies yielding 10 or 15 percent, or 15 to 20 percent, they don't actually give you the yield you think you're going to get. Clearly, if a company's yielding 15 percent, people don't necessarily expect that to be paid out. So, people say, well, you shouldn't buy high yielding shares because they're too risky. That's not necessarily right. Um, what's quite interesting is actually, although, um, although they don't give you the highest the yield that they may suggest, they do give you, generally, a very good yield. So the yield on shares that yield, that yield 8 to 9 percent may not be 8 to 9 percent, but it's actually considerably above the yield you actually achieve historically on shares that yield 4 or 5 percent. Um, so if you're looking for an income, buying high yielding shares is not necessarily um, a, a, a terrible thing to do. Um, now, the other point is, should you fear dividend cuts continued? Um, what happens to companies when they cut the dividends? Now, this chart here, and I'll try and explain it here, on the left-hand side, uh, from Morgan Stanley this time, this shows before a company cuts a dividend, it tends to underperform. It tends to fall in absolute price ahead of that and tends to underperform the market which, and, and the peer group and the sector. But actually, once they've cut the dividend, shares tend to outperform. They tend to go up. They tend to outperform. Um, and the longer you go out for 12 months or two, or two years, the more outperformance you tend to get. And what's really interesting, the second chart here, the higher the yield before the cut, actually the better the return subsequently. And the further the share has fallen before the cut, again, the better return. So what's going on here is the companies that are really depressed, where the yield has spiked up, where everyone's apocalyptic about the prospects for the business, if they do actually cut the dividend, like BHP Billiton, very often the shares spike up, very often it's near the bottom, and quite often you make a very good return as an investor. So, it's, so avoiding high-yielding shares just because their dividend might be a risk is, not, again, not necessarily the right strategy. Which brings me on to Merchants Trust, um, and I'll come back to what we do. Um, but just briefly, the objective of the Merchants Trust um, is well, it's got two, two prime objectives. The first is to deliver a high and rising dividend yield, and the second is to give a good capital return or a good total return to investors. Uh, the Merchants Trust has a dividend yield of 5.7%. It's one of the highest yields in the sector. And we have grown the dividend, or the board has grown the dividend every year for 34 years. And we have a strong reserves position. It's an actively managed, high conviction portfolio, and it has delivered strong performance. It is geared, and, and Russ talked about gearing earlier, and I'll come back to that. Um, and that will affect the way it performs. Um, but the NAV, the net asset value, will benefit over the next few years from a pull to par effect, because some of the debt that was taken out in the 1980s is getting close to maturity, and as it does so, the value of that debt drops and the NAV should benefit. It has a very low, modest, uh, very modest management fee, and I think the total combined, uh, what's the word? The uh, total cost, total cost about 0.6, which is about half of the number that uh, Russ was saying is the average of the sector. Our investment philosophy at Allianz Global Investors is understand, act. When we understand what's going on, we try and, we try and act and on the back of that. Now, we, under, we look at 110 years of, of stock market data, and I'm sorry at the back if you can't read this, but essentially, if you put one pound in the stock market in 1900, your pound would have grown, reinvesting your dividends, to 20,000 pounds by the end of 2010. 111 years. Uh, you'd have made £20,000 from your pound if you'd lived 111 years. Um, <laughs> it's a slight problem there. But if at the beginning of each year, instead of buying the top 100 companies, you bought only the 50 with the highest yield, your pound would have grown to £93,000. And you'd have outperformed the market by 1.5% per annum by a simple strategy of just buying the highest yielding shares every year. Now, that would have been quite a hairy ride. There have been certain times when that wouldn't have been very comfortable. Uh, and certainly, we don't just buy that. But it's an interesting um, thing to, re to remember at the back of your mind, that high yielding shares have historically performed very well. So what do we do? And how do we act on that? Well, we try and buy companies that have a good yield, a yield above the market, typically. But the yield is never the reason for buying a share. We say it's never sufficient reason. It's never the reason for buying a share. We're always looking at the total return we think we can get when we buy a company. And also importantly, we don't automatically sell a share if the yield drops below the market because if the share goes up, or if the company cuts a dividend, 
Quite often, a company will cut a dividend as part of a turnaround strategy. And as, as I showed you earlier, a dividend cut is not necessarily bad news as an investor. You can make good money after dividend cuts. So there's no automatic sell process if the yield drops below the market. Um, just a nice chart here about shares. We don't just buy them for the yield. Sorry, it's a bit complicated, this chart. There's two, the two charts at the top are the dividend yields of HSBC and Royal Dutch Shell. And as you'll know, almost certainly, the yields on these companies are very high today. HSBC yields 8%, which only exceeded in the financial crisis before they did actually cut their dividend. Um, and Royal Dutch Shell, the yield has probably never been this level. Royal Dutch Shell haven't cut their dividend since the Second World War. Um, that doesn't mean it's safe, but that's an interesting fact. And it's yielding 7 or 8% today. But that isn't why we own these shares. The charts, are, there's lots of other reasons to do with the valuation. And the charts at the bottom pick on a different, a different valuation measure. They look at the price to book, the, how much you pay for a pound of the assets of the business. Now, for HSBC, we are paying less today for a pound of its tangible book value than you did in the financial crisis. And in fact, you're paying less than a pound for every pound of tangible book value. And to us, that's really good value for one of the strongest banks in the world with a phenomenal position in Asia and Hong Kong and a very strong position in the UK. That's quite interesting to me, irrespective of the dividend yield. And Royal Dutch Shell, again, it's trading below asset value, which, it, as you can see from here, it hasn't done in, uh, in, in 30, 25, 30 years. So these are quite unusual periods. The valuations of these stocks are very cheap. Uh, and there are reasons for that, and I can, I'm very happy in questioning to explain them if you, if you want. So what do we look for in a company? Before I get into the example of Inmarsat, if you just look at the triangle in the middle, we look at three things. We look at the fundamentals of a business. How good a business is this? Uh, and some of the stuff that Catherine was talking about, about competitive strength, is absolutely important. The valuation, how cheap is this business? Um, and the third thing, though, is critical. If you're a value investor, if you're trying to buy companies that are cheap, but you think they're good, you've got to understand what's going to change. And this, the, the technology changes are absolutely important. As, as Catherine, was, again, was talking about disruptive threats, there are lots of issues out there. You don't want to buy a company just because it's cheap. You have to be confident that you know why it's cheap and that it's a genuine valuation opportunity rather than a structural pressure that's going to that's um, affect the long-term value of that business. So that's where we put our considerable resources in researching companies, both from our, our analysts who look at individual companies and our fund managers, but also our, our own market research company, which we can call on to do work on, on the way companies' products and services are perceived in the marketplace. So here's an example in Marsat. Now, um, they essentially provide satellites um, they've got a fleet of satellites, two fleets of satellites, that provide communications to marine vessels um, on the move, or aircraft, or other people who are a long way away from telephones. Um, they have uh, combinations of licenses, spectrum, and customer bases, which are very hard to, to match. Particularly in the marine, marine area, every large ship has to, by law, be connected to the Inmarsat network for emergency distress. And because of that, they can sell them other services. And, and we were just hearing about the, the explosion of, of broadband and demand for bandwidth. They can, they can supply these things. So they have a really strong position. It's a tough market to be in. It's very, it, it, the, the competition is it's quite difficult to get. You've got to launch a fleet of satellites, which will cost you $1.5 billion. You've got to get customers to pay for that. And you've got to have... Uh, the licenses in the spectrum. They've got a great position in the def defense market. Their latest satellite fleet has exactly the same technology as the US government uh, military. It was, it was built by Boeing, so it is exactly the same, and compa therefore compatible with all the, all the big militaries around the world. And they've got a joint venture with Deutsche Telekom, and they've got the only license to do uh, essentially Wi-Fi on a plane across Europe from the ground up. Uh, they've got a network there. So they've got a really strong market position uh, and, a, and, a, and a strong balance sheet, and all the financials are okay as well. In terms of valuation, the shares were very depressed a few years ago. Um, even today, even after they've performed very well, um, they still have a good dividend yield, and the cash flow on an underlying basis, and, and there are, it's complex, but on an underlying basis, the cash flow is still quite attractive in terms of valuation, so we'd still like it. And thematically, it ticks a lot of boxes. There is, it has growth. Today, growth is very hard to achieve in a low inflation, low growth environment. It has growth. It has a structural play on, on increasing bandwidth, increasing dem demand for communications. Um, and it has pricing power. It's demonstrated in certain areas it's been able to raise prices. Um, I have to move on a little bit. In terms of Merchants Trust, um, I talked about the objectives. Just very briefly, 
we have gearing, we have borrowings of about 21%, 111 million of debt on, on, on 500 million of net assets. Um, the dividend yield is 5.7%, and the discount is, it's actually coming a bit today, it's about 5% today, but it's about 7% when, the, when this was put together. The two objectives, we have raised, the board have raised the dividend every year for 34 years. What we show on this chart is periods in green where the board have put money aside to, into reserves, and the periods in red when they've dipped into the reserves um, to, to pay the dividend. So going into financial crisis, the board put a lot of money away into reserves, dipped into them then, and we're now back to a situation where the dividend is covered. And we still have considerable reserves within the, within the trust. Um, we have one of the highest yields in the sector, and it's quite interesting actually to see how many, how many funds in the sector, trusts in the sector, actually yield less than the market. Um, sorry, I'll jump, I'll jump that a bit, but um, the market yield is 4.1%. Um, in terms of sustainability of the yield, the question we always get is, aren't you just buying all the really high yielding stocks? Well, we do have, we do own Shell and BP and HSBC, and we do like those shares, and they, they yield a lot, and, and there are risks to some of those yields. Um, but actually, two-thirds of the portfolio yields 5% or less, and we don't see a significant r risk to those dividends. And, and about 15% yields less than 3%, where the dividend should grow pretty fast. So there's a mixture in the portfolio of high-yielding shares and a few shares where the dividend can, can be expected to grow. Second objective of the trust is to deliver a total return and capital growth. And we show here um, the blue line is the net asset value of the trust. Um, it's over five years, it's, it's outperformed the, the FTSE 100 index, but it does have gearing. At times when the market goes down, we tend to underperform because of the gearing. At times when the market goes up, we tend to do better. Um, and that's, you know, you have to understand that if you're going to invest in, in a geared trust, that is a feature of the trust. We hope that by having borrowings in the long term, if the markets go up, that will help the returns. Current themes within the portfolio, well, I'm not going to go through all of these, you'll be pleased to know. Um, we think some of the mega caps are really cheap. I've touched on HSBC and Shell, and I'm very pleased to go into more of that afterwards or over questions. Growth is hard to achieve. If you can find growth at a sensible price, and I do stress sensible price, we are value investors, um, then some of these companies like Hostel World, um, Inmarsat, um, Ashmore, which has got an emerging market debt manager, that's interesting. Um, the other area that's really interesting at the moment is recovery situations and turnaround situations. The market hates uncertainty, particularly at the moment in a difficult economic environment. If you can pr produce very stable growth, very steady profits, then the valuations are really high. And we talked about food producers and beverage companies. But if there's any element of risk in your business, if you're Labrooks and you're turning the company round, if you're Balfour Beatty and you've had a, quite a few profit warnings uh, and the construction market has been through a horrendous period, your shares generally are pretty depressed. Um, we see really good value in the medium to long term in some of these companies. Some of them are starting to perform. Carnival's been a great performer in the last couple of years. Um, but others have further to go or are at a different stage. So turnaround is probably the other area where we're putting a lot of money to work. We are very different to other funds in the sector. And in particular, we show here, we don't manage the fund against, we don't think about the FTSE 100 index when we invest. But investors want to know where we are positioned compared to the FTSE 100 index. What we show here is, if you look at where we're different, we've got a lot less invested in tobacco, household goods, beverages, and personal goods. A lot less invested than the index, and a lot less invested than the other, many of the other trusts in our sector. Where we have a lot of money, construction materials, we see a good recovery in the construction market in the next four or five years. Um, travel and leisure. It's not, a, it's not a question of the sector, but there are individual companies in that sector, Labrooks, um, Carnival, First Group, um, Green King. They're all in the same sector. They're all completely different, but they're all interesting companies. Um, and financial services is a very diverse sector, and we have a number of companies in there that we like. At the bottom, you can see the individual positions. Um, United Business Media is our biggest uh, active position, but you can see some of the other stocks. If we don't like a company, we won't own it. We don't own Vodafone, we don't own AstraZeneca, and so on. So finally, and I've got 30 seconds left, which is great, um, we have a strong performance record. We have a very active and really value-driven approach, which I think uh, hopefully has come through. Uh, we have, the directors have raised the dividend every year for 34 years. I haven't been doing it for that long. Um, and we have a high yield supported by the reserves. 
and uh, we believe we're well positioned for the future with, with a low management fee. And thank you very much for your time.